Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's FixFlow webinar. We are going to be talking is rather an optimistic um, subject, leasehold reform. When we thought about this, we thought it'd be really interesting. You know, Labour came in and said that the first 100 days yours measure a government by that and lots of stuff to carry on. Now, admittedly, they have had a few other little things on their plate, but we thought Cass and I would talk about the first 100 days of the Labour government. And of course, that would that would bring into um, into a highlight all things that the Leasehold and uh, Free Old Reform Act would, would have brought in by now, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, if we can just move on the next slide. First of all, could I introduce, if anybody doesn't know Cass, you should be absolutely ashamed of yourself. But Cass, would you care to introduce yourself? Thank you. Good morning, Nigel. I'm Cassandra hey. Zanelli, Solicitor and CEO at Property Management Legal Services. That was a quick one. And as everybody who's been in property management should know, Cass is basically the go-to person on all aspects of leasehold and reform. And we we have shared the stage many, many a time. I have a disclaimer, no doubt, to say if I can get the next slide up. So here we go. All content presented in this webinar is intended for general information purposes only and should not be considered as legal advice or official guidance. Now, normally I, I read that out with a smile, but seeing I've got a legal beagle Oh, no, no, it's particularly apposite. Um, it is a two-way session. There is the ability to do Q and A's. Please do do that. We will break off during the talk to to go down the various rabbit holes uh, that, that crop up. So it is interactive. Don't feel you have to wait for the end. Anything we don't do by the end, we'll try and catch up with um, later on and send out. It is being recorded. So if you have to pop out or if something pops up that you want other people to see, you can get it later on. Right, let us get going. So what we are intending to do is look about or contemplate a bit on Labour's plans for leasehold. A lot of this will be future gazing. Um, for those of you not familiar, what happens with legislation? It go, it bounces between the Houses of Commons and Lords in a process called ping pong, which is where each side tries to amend and improve. Now, obviously, politics pays a part. So if you're, a, if you're in government, the last thing you want is the opposition to put forward something good that you pass because they'll take credit for it. So it tends to get watered down. What happened in this particular case for this act, it went into a strange thing called wash up, which is at the end of a government. The government goes through a whole range of bills that haven't been fully debated and basically goes to the incoming government to say you're going to be stuck with these any of these we can just whiz through pretty much undiscussed and i'm afraid the leasehold reform act came through under that wash up so it hadn't been fully scrutinized what then happens is there's a lot in there uh, it's called you'll, you'll have heard these phrases primary and secondary legislation I think the easiest way to go between those is primary says we're going to do something and who can actually influence that thing then secondary is that person then says, well, what are the details? So, for example, if we're talking about um, marriage value, which, which, which is in here, marriage value, the primary legislation will say the Secretary of State can appoint the formula for marriage value. That goes through. But, of course, A, it's not in force yet, and B, until you get the secondary legislation, which is the Secretary, Secretary of State saying, and the formula is, you don't know what on earth to do. And that's where I'm afraid we're kind of stuck at. The first 100 days was we were hoping we'd have secondary legislation or a lot more of it so we could actually talk about what is, well, sorry, what has happened. What we're going to have to talk about now is there are a few things that are in place, but also what might be happening and what it might look like. So not quite where Cass and I wanted to be, but that's where we're at. So I think that's hopefully a fair summary. Have I missed anything else on that one, Cass? No. I'm just on the, the subject of primary and secondary, the best example that I give is Section 20, because we know Section 20 tells us that we need to consult or obtain dispensation if we're doing um, qualifying works that are going to cost more than 250 quid. So it's Section 20 that tells us that, but the process as to how we consult, we go to the regulations to look at. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good example. And we, we've got a, well, very few examples of that now. We'll, we'll be opining on what might be the process that, that's going ahead. So Labour's plan for freehold we've done, leasehold and freehold reform act. Now, as I've caveated, there's only a few things in there which have actually make any sense, if I can put it that way. What do you think, Cass, I've got a few things down here for top issues, service charge demands. I, you know, Bearing in mind, everybody here is a, is a property manager and serving service charge demands. I'd like to look at those, look at the accounts, because there are some things in there which are going to affect the way property managers do things 
no matter what the secondary legislation says, because there's going to be fines involved, there's things you you must do or else it's not valid. A lot of the shift of this act is protecting leaseholders, no bad thing. But don't forget, if you're on the other side of that, which managing agents tend to be, it means protecting leaseholders in a sense against the freeholder and their, allo their allocated agent. So there's there's bear traps sitting around. Absolutely. And, and a lot of it is about standardization, standardization as to when um, what documents are um, to look like. So what service charge demands are to look like, what Section 20B2 notices are to look like, accounts, etc., and setting some time frames around when those things are to be done. So um, hopefully it will assist from that point of view. But as you say, Nigel, there are some bear traps for the unwary in relation to the legislation. And I should perhaps stress at the outset the things that we're going to talk about with regards to service charge demands, accounts, insurance, litigation costs, all of those kind of good things, they are not yet in force. They're in the legislation. The legislation has been passed, but they are not yet in force. So please, agents who are tuned in and watching this webinar, please don't go changing your standard service charge demands that you have as templates on your system or your accounts or having sleepless nights about this stuff yet. We're telling you what is likely to be coming down the track. It ain't on the track or at the station just yet. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we, we talked a bit about that earlier, Cass, that a, a good example of that would be the sales pack cap, which was £250. Now, at least with that, we know what the number is. So that's secondary legislation, but it hasn't passed yet. So it's, that's an, a, a to-do in the future. So if somebody points out to you at the moment, oh, you can only charge me £250, then the answer is no, that, that is not yet um, been passed. That's an intention, not law. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to focus, Nigel, aren't we, on the things that are going to affect managing agents on a day-to-day -day basis. I know that lots of commentators have spoken a lot about the changes that the Act makes to enfranchisement, to lease extensions, to right to manage. I think our focus for this webinar is going to be the nuts and bolts things mm. that affect managing agents on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than, albeit it's very interesting, what's proposed in relation to enfranchisement, lease extensions, RTM. It's the stuff that affects managing agents day to day that we're going to look at this morning. It is a, sort of bouncing off slightly to the side. One of, one of the intentions of a, a lot of this, the drivers, if you remember, was the ground rent scandal, as they called it, doubling ground rents every 10 years. Um, and so you can't do ground rents on new bills. Now, I think the intention there or the hope was suddenly common holes would pop up magically everywhere. But talking to the industry it sounds like absolute that nothing is like that's happened what's more happening is the developers are just going to the leaseholders and saying congratulations you now have to run this block um so here's the rmc please give us some directors over to you are, are you seeing any common holds at all I, I haven't come across any we've still got the magic 16 i think no is the short answer to that i don't know whether any of our delegates that are watching this today have any common holds that they're managing, but it'd be really interesting to, to know if, um, I haven't seen an increase, but if other people have, please shout up and tell us. I think I'd be really interested in you, probably would be as well, Nigel. Yeah, I remember, I'm trying to remember who it was now, at, at your last conference in Oxford, plug there, book now for the next one uh, in, in March. Somebody did say they were just about to take over. A, it's a lady at the back. Ah, embarrassing. Um, they were just about to take over a common hold, and that might be something to, to discuss at the conference. You know, what's it like managing com uh, a common hold? Um, um, I, I'd be astonished if it isn't very similar to an RMC, but with a different set of rules. But, you know, how do you take votes, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, we, we, we digress. We digress into that one. Service charge demands. You mentioned those. So let's start wading into the dear old LFRA. And what, what are the sort of issues, what, what's come through and what, what are the bits that we're sort of going to be a bit puzzled about? Let's start the... If we deal with it in the order that the Act sets matters out, and first of all, the Act talks about Section 20B2 notices, and I'm sure everybody watching this will be familiar with Section 20B2 notices. Those are the um, notices that you will send to leaseholders, essentially saying something along the lines of, and of course there's no prescribed form, dear leaseholder, for service charge year ending I don't know, 30th of September 2024, we have spent £100,000. You are subsequently going to be required in accordance with the terms of your lease to contribute to that by means of payment of a service charge. 
Many agents are sending those out as a matter of course. Many agents are adding those Section 20B2 notices to the service charge year-end accounts. It's there, um, it's, it's part of the 18-month rule, and sending that 20B2 notice stops that clock ticking for the purposes of the 18-month rule. What the we eight, have... Sorry, Kat, I'm interrupting there. The 18-month rule, I got caught out on this, and I kind of thought I knew a bit about leasehold, because I thought the 18 months was calendar. Let, let's say your service charge was January the 1st, and you don't get it by June the 30th next year, ah, outside Section 20B. But it turns out, no, Section 20B kind of comes in when you've beaten the budget. So if, if that's October, it's 18 months from October, not from January. I think that's quite a common misconception. I certainly had it for a long time. Yeah, you're absolutely right with that. The The caveat to that is having served a contractually valid demand. Mm. I, I bang on about the importance of serving contractually valid demands a lot. And so on the assumption that you've served a contractually valid demand, the 18-month clock starts to tick from when you have exhausted, to use the language of the case law, when you have exhausted the budgeted sums and you continue to incur costs. Costs are incurred when liability to make payment sufficiently crystallizes. So it's 18 <laughs> months from when you've spent up and you carry on spending. We've got a very cryptic question. Graham, you put, this is slightly off topic, but I need to get to the bottom of this. Full stop. You might want to add a bit more to that, then we can then we can help you whatever it is you want to get to the bottom of. I'm intrigued. Could be a coffee order, yeah. Sorry, Cass, I, I, I interrupted. So sec section 20, um, B2, you've you're starting to serve the notices. Absolutely. And we absolutely. And we now have those notices under the new act called um, notice of future service charge demands. So we'll be changing the language that we use. They serve essentially the same purpose, but what we are likely to have under the Act is this future demand notice setting out in writing that relevant costs have been incurred and that a leaseholder is subsequently going to be required under the terms of the lease to contribute to those by payment of a variable service charge. What we will have that we don't at the moment, so perhaps Harpreet to answer your question, is that we don't have at the moment a prescribed form of Section 20B2 notice. There's certain work that that notice has to do, but it's not in a prescribed form. What we will have when this bit of the new act comes into force is that we will have regulations that give us the prescribed form of that notice, that give us the specified information to be contained in it, and tell us how that's going to be given to the leaseholders as well. So as you mm. say, Nigel, the devil is in the detail with the secondary legislation that's likely to be coming down the track or that will need to be coming down the track. And, and to be fair with, with the government, you, you've got to bear in mind uh, you know, that there is only so much debate you can do in the House. There's only so much lawyer time that they've got access to because writing writing parliamentary acts is difficult. We've got an anecdote on that. So it's just not been up there. It's got to, they've got people who are interested in this, MPs who are interested in it, have to bid for time for, to have debate and for the lawyers. I, mean, I think, think a job we come on to it a bit later about, but the, the um, being able to put in a director outside of the service charge because we're trying to think, how do we do the, you know, if, if the whole board disappears for a responsible person, Andrew Bulmer and I sort of uh, talked to, Lord Greenhalgh, as was in a very strange day, but he basically said, "Can you can you write it?" And we just said yes without knowing what that meant. Rang up Justin and said, "Oh, we just need a bit in there that the service charge you can pay for an external director." Figured it'd be a two minute call, five hours, because of course it's such a specialist area. Because Justin was saying, "Well, that affects the you know this act over here and that act over there and this here this here." Um, it is a complicated matter writing parli parliamentary acts. So a bit of a defence for the government. I was a bit glib at the beginning saying nothing's happened because they've had a few other things on the plate. But that's why it takes a long time. You've got to bid for time, both in terms of parliamentary time and lawyerly time. So this stuff never comes out fast. We're talking a lot of the stuff here, probably two, three years before we get to see it. Anyway, back to Everybody's back, guess on that one. <laughs> yeah, back back to the the twenty B, and this is one of the bear traps, isn't it? Because suddenly there's a value involved yeah. for property managers. Yeah, and the risk of applications being made to the tribunal to force um, things such as the service charge demand and to force the 
um, accounts and the like to be given to the leaseholder and the payment of damages in the mm. event that these things aren't done. Yeah. But I think the bit I'm thinking about here is you have to not only say, I mean, in, in the past, 20 years basically said um, we've overspent and we'll, we'll buy this much in total and we'll be uh, making a claim later on. Whereas now, don't you have to go and say, and you, Cass, your personal number is, and if I exceed that, when I finally worked it all out, you only have to pay what I told you your personal maximum was. We have that at the moment. So the the um, amount that's put in our 20B2 notice is the amount that we are capped at recovering. So if we put in our 20B2 notice that we have spent for year ending 30th September £100,000, and actually when we do the accounts or get handover from our predecessor, whatever the circumstances might be, we've spent £120,000, then we're capped at the but then doesn't that mean everybody has to put in, I hate to say, massive contingencies? Because you don't know. I mean, the whole point of a Section 20B is we, we don't know what the accounts are. This is our bestest guess. Yeah. Um, people probably are on the side of caution unless they have the accounts produced and the 20B2 forms part of the service charge account. Mm. It depends on the circumstances that are giving rise to the need or desire to serve the Section 20B2 notice. And sometimes it's done as a matter of convenience. Sometimes it's done because of, I say that the um, example that I get quite a lot is because of a difficult handover from a predecessor. You don't have all of the accounting information you need to be able to draw those accounts, but to, as a protective measure, you're serving a 20B2 notice. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a bit off to topic, but you do kind of wish we had more joined up systems that you could say, you know, I, ha I have lost this property. Here's the code to access it in our accounting system, be it in the cloud or whatever, if you have compatible accounting systems, and you just hoover it across rather than this sort of chasing everybody out. That 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 neatly comes on to a potential standardized chart of accounts. If you remember the Building Safety Act, at one stage it was, we'll have a completely separate building charge outside of the service charge. So that is absolutely clear what this what the building safety costs are and there was the industry pushed back saying well ooh, hang on that's two regimes you'll confuse leaseholders to hell because you'll be sending them a service charge demand then a different demand am i allowed to say hell on webinars probably um etc cetera, etc cetera. so the, the the government came back and said, well how can we make this clear and we said well standard chart of accounts you know with a sunset clause give people a few years to put in but then everybody would know you know you can't put down put down whatever you want. I mean, from my own experience, I went into MRI and they said, well, what, what do you want to call utilities? And you go, well, okay, utilities, but you might want to call it sparky wet stuff. You can actually write that if you want to. Um, so a standard chart of accounts have to be quite complicated. They're going to have to really get a lot of input because, you know, as we know, buildings are complicated. Not everybody has a spa, but somebody will. Um, and then that the theory is that means that leaseholders can understand more clearly when they move between places or between agents because everything's, nicely detailed but also when an agent does a handover it's pretty obvious where everything goes because at the moment you might get utilities and everything bung together and you're going well i, I do electricity gas and water how do i split this out Absolutely. so standard chart of accounts but again yeah. not, not much closer on that one no and we have two accountancy type uh, provisions within the leasehold and freehold reform act so we have the service charge accounts and there are provisions that will require the service charge accounts to be, as you say, Nigel, in that standardized form. What that looks like, we don't know. It's going to come in regulations, but also to be delivered within six months of year end. Um, and we also have, as well as the accounts, we have what the legislation calls an annual report, uh, which is essentially, yes. I paraphrase, but essentially a summary of expenditure. And that needs to be sent within one month of year end mm. that's the one when i speak to agents that's the one that seems to worry them um, a little and i can understand that because it may be that the figures and details that are in the summary aren't necessarily because it's done so quickly after year end might not necessarily be the figures that translate into the account yeah the, and anybody the, who's, who's done may be different yeah and anybody who's ever done the end of year accounts the, the reason it's not laziness as everybody hopefully on this all know that it takes quite a while to put the accounts together is because stuff comes in late you know contractors bless them it takes time for stuff to get through their systems and to raise invoices etc etc stuff just comes in late and you have to wait a reasonable amount of time bef before you put all the work into doing the accounts to go oh god we've got some more invoices you have to go back and redo them again 
Yeah, absolutely. And the enforcement provisions that we have touched upon, they apply to this um, annual report. So this report that goes out within one month of year end. So if that doesn't happen, then there is powers for the leaseholder to make an application to the tribunal. So we're extending the jurisdiction of the tribunal um, that a landlord, remember for these purposes, we're in the 85 Act. So landlord is anyone that's entitled to enforce payment of a service charge. There's the ability for the leaseholder to make that application to the tribunal on the basis that a landlord has failed to provide that report. And the tribunal will have powers to order a landlord to um, to produce and provide that report and also to pay damages for the failure, damages not to exceed £5,000. But to stress again, this is still to come, isn't it? Absolutely. Please so don't you, have nightmares. Yeah. So everybody on the call, you need to be aware that this is coming and have it in the back of your head. But uh, as Cass says, don't run back to, to your PC screaming on this one just yet. Don't go and start handing in your notes and looking for jobs elsewhere. Harpy, was there ever suggested to reduce 18 months rule to 15? Uh, Not that I'm aware of. No, I think there was discussion about bringing it forward at one stage uh, in time slots. There's something a bit familiar about that, but I think that died a very early death in consultation. Would, I wouldn't like to nail myself across on that one, Harpreet, but I think I think we did have some chats about bringing stuff in. Um, How's right. your knowledge on that one, Nigel? <laughs> no, that's in the dim distant past, that one. Anything else on service charge demands and accounts? Not you want to add? Me. There's, no, there's no questions that's come in, so... Okay, should we move on to the fun topic of litigation costs? Yes. Yeah. Agents will be familiar at the moment with Section 20C orders. And a Section 20C order prevents the landlord from recovering its um, costs associated with proceedings by the service charge mechanism. And when we're dealing with those kind of orders, we talk about Section 20C orders, which relate to service charge and being able to put those litigation costs through the service charge, and also Paragraph 5A orders, which are the same thing, but relating to admin charges, both prevent those costs um, being put through either, either a service charge or an admin charge. What we have under the new act, and again, at the risk of sounding like a bit of a broken record, this isn't yet in force, but what we have under the new act is a flip reverse of that. Section 20C goes, and what we have instead is the need for a landlord Remember, landlord, anyone that's entitled to enforce payment of a service charge, the need for a landlord to apply for what's called a Section 20CA order that entitles the landlord to recover those costs of what are called relevant proceedings by the service charge. I worry a little bit about the litigation cost matter. Does I worry that, that it will... Um, well, I worry that it is going to... There are times that litigation is necessary. There are times that it's not necessary, but there are times that it is appropriate to make an application to the tribunal, let's say, because we need urgent dispensation from consultation, or that we make an application to the tribunal for um, a Section 27A determination that we are entitled to spend £1 million on those particular product of work. I worry that the litigation cost provisions will prevent um, and or cause management companies to have second thoughts about whether to take that appropriate litigation to the tribunal. And what about more mundane litigation? Nigel Glenn hasn't paid a service charge. At the moment, Cass Zanelli Property Management hands me over to a debt recovery organisation after, you know trying to to convince Nigel that there is an obligation and, and a debt here and figure out why Nigel isn't paying. What about those litigation costs? Absolutely the same. So doesn't that fundamentally change the dynamic of that? Where at the moment it's a f not seamless, but it's for the managing agents, it's relatively easy. You pass it over to, you know, cast debt collection. But 
if I did that to you once this is enforced, it's not yet, but once it's enforced, what is CAS going to say back to me as a property manager? Well, as part of that, because what normally happens with service charge recovery, which is essentially what you're talking about, Nigel, mm. what normally happens with service charge recovery is that the landlord, and again, whoever's entitled to enforce payment, um, obtains as part of the judgment against the defaulting lessee um, the the cost that they have incurred in bringing those proceedings is wrapped up into that judgment so that when the judgment is settled, those legal fees are also settled. What this um, new section does is it prevents those legal fees if invoices are raised and would otherwise go through the service charge. It prevents those legal fees going through the service charges unless and until the court make that Section 20 CA order. So what I think is likely to happen using my best crystal ball gazing, albeit trying not to live up to my namesake as being prophesied with doom and gloom, <laughs> um, what I think is likely to happen, as well as um, bringing that money claim against a leaseholder for non-payment of £1,500, £2,000, whatever it might be, there will also be an accompanying application for that Section 20 CA order so that and the landlord has the ability to recover those costs by the service charge. It's going to be interesting to see how the case law in relation to that pans out. Um, we will see on that. But do you think it will change the dynamic? Because putting my head right back to 2016, last time I was a property manager, I would send over to, you know, cast debt collections that this person has done. And it was just placed an email, here you go, here's the details, and off you go. Whereas, aren't you now going to come back and say, that's very interesting, Nigel, uh, will you indemnify me for the cost that I will incur? And then that's me as the, going back to my landlord and saying, are you prepared to do an indemnity or, or pay for this? And particularly if it's a third-party landlord, or actually, I don't know why, particularly at RMC, they're going to go, well, we don't want to pay. Why, why, why should we pay to take somebody to court who's not doing their service charges? It's the practicalities yeah, of this are a bit concerning. Yeah, part of what we do at PMLS is arrears recovery, and we do what many um, other solicitors firms do on arrears recovery. We we act on a no win no fee basis. Um, when this bill was first published, I'm sure that I was doing um, what many of my other competitors were doing and looking at it and going what impact is this going to have on the no win no fee model is the no win no fee model a viable model moving forward that i think is where we are going to see some changes in the market which is going to have a knock-on effect on agents and, mm. and how they are recovering those arrears for their clients because it could be win but still no fee couldn't it yes. i suspect we will see some different models coming forwards um out of that one to watch mm. yeah so that's that's a worrying one. Again, it sounds quite. You can just see somebody sitting in a in a in a smoke filled room. Not going to do that anymore. But saying, "Oh, this this protects leaseholders," but then the unintended consequence could be the collapse of a service charge because once some people realise they don't have to pay, well, they still have to, but nothing, there's no consequences of not paying. Then everybody else starts going, "Well, why why am I doing this?" And then you get that spiral of decay that that we've seen in other uh, other jurisdictions. It can be that vicious circle, isn't it? That um, many of the landlords, many of the management companies, RTM companies, named managers um, are dormant companies. The only source of funds they have are the service charge funds. They collect those service charges and expend those funds in the provision of services. Mm. If they don't have the funds there, they can't provide the services. And it, it tends to, in my experience, if services aren't being provided, leaseholders are unhappy, they stop paying their service charges, it disintegrates from there. Yeah, the, fra the phrase I've, I came across in Australia and Canada was zombie buildings, because once it starts, it snowballs, and then you can't do anything with that building. You know, you can't rent things out in it, you can't sell. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a circle, it's a very nasty circle. I think they get that in Scotland as well, if you look at the 2016 Rich Report, which is pretty damning on the state of affairs. Anyway, that's in danger of treading into, into tenure areas. Um, so we've done that one. A little, little one lurking in relation to litigation costs as well. Mm -hmm. Nobody's really spoken about this one much, but I thought we'd speak about it, Nigel, and and flag it. 
And it's the right of leaseholders to claim litigation costs from landlords. Mm. At the moment, we often think of the tribunal as a no-cost jurisdiction where landlords will go and they will be able to recover their costs on a contractual basis from a leaseholder, but safe in the knowledge that unless they behave unreasonably, they're not going to end up with a cost order. What we have in the new act is um, the ability, and it's a term that's implied into leases, for a leaseholder to claim their litigation costs from the landlords, and a tribunal will make that order if they think it's just and equitable to do so. So one to watch out for on that. Mm. That doesn't sound unreasonable on the face of it, though, does it? As a leaseholder myself. Oh. Mm. The level playing field. Yeah. That's the, the thing that keeps bashing into the back of my mind is what's the queue at the FTTP at the moment? Six months? Gosh, it depends what region. Mm. Some regions are um, dealing with a bigger backlog than other regions. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's all very well sort of tinkering or saying you can go to the tribunal, but there's a big question behind that, isn't it? Because the, the, the tribunal was originally based, almost supposed to be no cost, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the first, I think the only one I, I, I went to, we were uncontested. We just wanted their advice on whether it was block or estate service charge. Mm-hmm. And the first thing the judge said is, where's your solicitor? Well, we haven't got one. We're not fighting this. We just want you to opine. And he got quite irate. I think he actually went to the solicitor to give him the answer. But what I mean by that anecdote is, it is it is time consuming. Um, it's not an easy process. I think there could be a lot done to streamline it. Um, I'm straining on Siobhan's uh, feet there, but it's it's woefully underfunded from what I can gather. The disappointing thing, and I use a phrase that Justin uses, is that um, leasehold law is a bit like a magic spell book, where only certain people know where the spells are and what effect one spell has on another. Mm. That's that's what makes it difficult sometimes for and those without representation. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, uh, yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is. That's what I, say. I, I can understand why you, you do, I wouldn't do it again to go with that solicitor. It's just a shame. We just thought this is easy, open and cut case. We just want to know, here's the facts. It's an insurance claim. Where do we put the bill? Is it a block? Or is it because the insurance policy was this, you know, a block leaked or a washing machine in a block leak, but the insurance policy was across the estate? where does the repair bill go? Because one of them triggers Section 20, the other one didn't. So we just went went to ask for advice. They normally like you to go with a positive case. This is what we think. Can you determine that we're right with that? Well, we were innocent. We were innocent. Right, Graham's come out with, uh, yes, I hate return by mistake. Yeah, this is the Q&A section. With, do you want to, I won't read it out to you, Cassie. you want to read it? I, I will read it through. It looks to be about leaseholder protections and certificates. Yeah. And um, we'll spend a few minutes at the end, Nigel, talking about the recent upper tribunal decision that yes. sets out a framework for the how we're one. dealing with. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, all right, Graham, if you can forgive us, we will come back to that one then. So litigation costs and that insurance, this is one that's obviously been hot for quite some time, yeah. if you pardon the pun. Yeah, the, the, the C word, mm. commissions. What we have in the Act is we have excluded insurance costs that um, won't be able to be recovered by the service charge mechanism. Um, And then we have permitted insurance payments. Um, Quite what permitted insurance payments are, I don't know. And I don't know because the Act simply says permitted insurance payment is a payment of a description specified in regulation. So we're back back to the secondary again. Absolutely. So this is basically, thou shalt not just take a blanket commission. You have to, at least there's recognition there is work involved. Um, And it might be different types of work, such as the admin to do the claim, if you are entitled to do so. I think there's going to be a bit of scrutiny on that about who's allowed to do it and who isn't. Uh, if you're FCA, et cetera, et cetera. And then secondarily, what happens when a claim happens? Because those of us who have been stuck in lift shafts at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday after a fire, we'll know about that. And an awful lot of time and effort goes into solving claims. What we do know is the kind of things that might be included within the regulations because the Act tells us that. So the Act tells us that the regulations may provide that a permitted insurance payment 
um, by reference to the kind of person to or in respect of which the payment is made. So who is the payment going to? Broker, agent, landlord, um, whoever else might be um, getting those payments. The circumstances in which the payment is made. So what are the triggers for that payment? The method by which the payment is calculated. And I think that probably gets at the mischief of what this section is intended to and be directed towards. And that method might even be specified in the regulations. The nature of its connection with the work done, costs incurred or time spent, and nice catch-all, anything else, any other matter. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a political statement, isn't it, on, on this one? Um, Martin, sorry, there's a couple of questions popped in. Martin uh, has got, wasn't the recovery of payment an issue for common hold? I don't think a practical solution to this was ever established. Uh, not so much for common hold because we don't really know much about common hold. So like I said, there's only 16 of them. Certainly in Australia with Strata, it it is. So the, the I, I was in Queensland and at least in that state, because obviously each state is, is different, the second highest um, reason to go to the uh, their version of the FTTP was somebody suing their own common hold council or strata council for failure to maintain their building so they couldn't rent out their unit. And that was might have been geographic because a lot of them were bought by o overseas people trying to, you know, buying a beach bond so they could live in Australia or have a permit to, to, to do that and just didn't pay their charges and there was nothing they can do about it. Scotland's the same. The only time you can get back, if you like this, want a better phrase, service charges, it's contribution obviously, is when somebody sells. Um, and then you have to put an order against the, the proceeds of the sale, but otherwise you can't do really do anything. And there are some fairly notorious cases going through there where people of uh, a not particularly savory variety living in Malaga um, just don't pay at all ever so it, it is it is a problem um as we said litigation to recover payment is, is something which politicians don't like but you do need it it's like forfeiture it's really unpleasant but if you don't have that stick then at some stage it falls into into a downward spiral sorry so box there but... what you do have with common hold is you have a process that explains um how you go about enforcing non-compliance so non-compliance uh, by um, not paying your um, common hold charges and you have various quite quirky ways of being able to recover um, those arrears for example if, if they're not paid and things such as rent diversion so if the mm. common hold unit is being let out you can apply for rent diversion so the the rent comes to the common hold association clears the arrears and they start to get the rent back again after that but again it's it's quite an elaborate process isn't it it's, a, it's the process mm. there's a route there it's the process that has to be gone through to get to to the end goal mm. and martin second question is it viable to reduce insurance premiums for leaseholders by requiring the insurer to take some of the risk and insuring a building based on a percentage of the bdv mm. there's loads of ways to reduce insurance um but I think the government lets the market sort itself out. Then they don't opine on the level of insurance, and the ABI did a particularly good job of of whitewashing that. Um, it's frankly the ABI pointed to the managing agents and said it's the it's all their fault for taking commissions, and the government ran down that rabbit hole very gleefully. I'm not sure I've answered your question there, Martin, but I don't think it is viable that way. The idea is insurance premiums are set by an open marketplace and we're in a hard market with very few players and they've woken up to the the risks in resi. And as everybody, if you ever talk to insurers, say it's nothing to do with fire, it's to do with water. And the very poor construction, particularly in the early 2000s with push fit pipe, uh, that's where a lot of the claims are coming from, water leaks. Right. Sorry about that one. I did have a note down here to, to, to talk to you about FTTP compliance versus maintenance versus repair. And I've got brackets Justin written after it. Close that was brackets. a case that we talked about, but um, yeah. come on to that at the end if we have time. Um, there are some, just to, to kind of square the circle in relation to um, the, the new act, there are some changes that are in the new act relating to estate management. 
and specifically estate management charges. So there's regulation of estate management. But what I mean by estate management, to paraphrase, is where you have those um, developments where there is open space that needs to be managed. Mm. Managing agents are managing not only blocks of flats these days, but those um, developments. Gardens, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that public open space. What we don't have at the moment is very much protection for those dwelling holders who are paying those estate management charges. With leasehold, we have sections 18 to 30, for example, of the 85 Act that set out those raft of protections for leaseholders. Service charges must be reasonable mm. if it's um, about to fall into my own trap there. If it's qualifying works, we have to consult, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have at the moment that same level of protections for those that are paying those estate management charges. So what the new act does, it, it introduces similar protections to what we have in leasehold for those that are paying the estate management charges. So there is going to be a standard form of demand, standard chart of accounts, limitation on um, recovery of those charges on a reasonableness basis, section 20B or the equivalent of and section 20B, the ability to apply to the tribunal to determine those estate management charges, and also the ability to apply for um, a manager to be appointed. So in the same way that we have with the leasehold block, where it isn't a successful and coherent scheme of management, something's going wrong, the tribunal can appoint a manager under section 24 of the 87 Act, similar provisions, and that so far as those estates are concerned, where dwelling holders pay that estate management charge. Again, I stress, not in force yet. Hmm. I often wonder, though, is, is the problem further up the path, though? So it's when developers go to the council and say, we want to build you know, a thousand houses here. And the council goes, yeah, on condition that you lay the drains, the roads, the verges, and you pay for them from now on. And they abrogate their obligation to maintain. And that's when people say, well, why do I have to pay an estate charge? It's because the council, you know, I pay council tax because the council has specifically carved itself out of that. Isn't that, am I being naive? Is that the, the problem is, 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 you know, way before you hit the iceberg. These were adopted, then it wouldn't be an issue. Hmm. Or the scale of the issue wouldn't be what it is. I don't disagree <laughs> with you there at all. It, there's also the education piece around, I mean, being a techie lawyer, these are variable um, estate rent charges. And when you say to a freeholder, you need to pay a variable estate rent charge, they go, I own my property, I don't rent it. Well, we get the same in ESL, don't we? You don't, I still remember the very first time I got that. You don't understand, I bought my flat, I don't have to pay service charges. That was a horrible conversation to have, and one which I became painfully used to have, used to having over the next seven years. And yeah, everybody on this call knows that's not fun because you, you're t basically telling somebody who's just bought their dream that you've got to find thousands of pounds that for some reason, well, not for some reason, because nobody told you. Again, hobby horse on that about uh, about um, conveyancing and when you should be told stuff. Maybe that's a neat segue into the sales information requests. There we go. Because we have... See, we're um, good at this. Absolutely. We have both in the estate management side of things and also in the leasehold side of things, provisions in the Act relating to sales information requests. Um, at the moment, absent something funky in the lease, there's no legal requirements, um, statutory or contractual, for a managing agent to produce and reply to inquiries. What the Act does it is it imposes that obligation to reply to inquiries. So there will be a standard form of um, request for that sales information. There will be a standard form of reply and frankly, anything else that government decides to throw into regulations as well at a standard cost and a standard time to respond. So standardizing. So as back we, to what we said at the beginning. As we all know, it's never the case that you can send off yeah, you know, an LPE one and everybody goes, yeah, that's fantastic. The next set of questions come back. Now, I can be sarcastic and say that's because the conveyancer is earning 100 or 20 quid a letter on each of those. Um, but there's two or three iterations. Can you and you can't charge for the, the replies? So do you just how how does that work? I send you the LP one for my two fifty. Yeah. See that that does worry me because uh, 
you're buying a 15 million pound penthouse with gyms that's going to be a very different level of inquiry than a studio flat in Cardiff, sorry, if any of the Welsh sort of listening here, but just proportionally. Um, and you're going to expect a lot more drilling down. I mean, it's all very well, you know, you're going to people say, I don't care, to, I don't care what it costs. I, I'm happy to pay more. I don't know. It just doesn't work for me, this, this one size fits all. We have almost a one size fits all with the LP1 and the FME1 doesn't cover everything does it i mean i was part of the, the design of the lp1 as we all were and it's a, it's the standard form but it, it doesn't really go into you know I'm, I'm looking at buying a house at the moment I'm, I'm asking about the heat pump service charge and condition not service charge service history and condition that's not in there um i need to see that documentation the conveyance is you know a whizzing to and fro and arguing with each other about whether or not i should be allowed to go for that don't mm. go around my soapbox about conveyances nigel Yes, I know. Uh, something else we talked about. I, I mentioned about the building safety director and the, the infamous call with Justin, the two minutes that turned into five hours. So that's there, the the ability to do. But again, the devil is in the detail, none of which is, is apparent. You've got some thoughts on on what's, what we need to see there and what's missing, apart from we can appoint one. It, Sorry, the, the, the client can appoint one. <laughs> As you say, we have section 111 that says um, a resident-led organisation can appoint a building safety director for building safety purpose. And we have that overriding whatever might be in the lease and overriding whatever might be in the memorandum and articles of association and the ability to pay that building safety director from the service charges. So we know the high level stuff we don't have is the detail. Um, I'm a little disappointed that there was a consultation about building safety directors and um, that finished, gosh, Nigel, was it February, 8th of February, 2022, something like that? This is the building safety we, manager, was it, when we were... No, the building safety, safety director, director might have been 23. Oh, sorry. Um, but it certainly finished well over a year ago and we still haven't had the consultation response to that. We have There's this an awful of lot the... of consultations like that where we haven't had anything back. I'm on my soapbox now, Nigel. I've joined you. No, go for it. Go for that. it. Um, so that, that's disappointing that whilst we have the headline ability to appoint a building safety director, I have no idea what that looks like because we don't have the consultation response. We don't have the regulations. Is it a corporate director? Something as basic as that. Is it a corporate director or is it somebody that's employed by the company that has the job title director? Mm. I don't know. I, I missed that consultation. That was a, that was that lovely period after I left TPI, where I didn't get involved in government for about a year. <laughs> Sorry, wistful there. Oh, and even something as simple as what competence does that building safety director have to have? They're appointed for a building safety purpose to assist those lay directors. How competent do they have to be? Do they have to, in fact, be competent? If so, to what standard? This this does worry me. Again, we're we're going completely off track here, but this really does worry me that the government push to have self determination, self management. You know, it's, it's laudable from certain points of view, but you're talking a building safety. You're talking ma other people's massive amounts of money. I I just can't get my head around why I think Andrew Bullmore says that you know the lead violinist of the London Symphony Orchestra is uniquely qualified to do that. Uh, uh, it's it just strikes me as Odd. It'd be like saying, you know, I, I don't need to take the car in for the service because I can do it. You know, I'm sure I can have a crack at the brakes. Uh, at, at what stage do you kind of go, yeah, we want people to have control over their finance and their destiny, but but you're, you're putting people who there's no requirement. Anybody can do it. We've all done it. We glass of wine over dinner, Nigel, join the board, and on you go. And you don't realise you're the director of a UK company and what that means. What the, the We've all, I'm sure, argued with with directors, particularly of RMCs, about, no, you, you've got to do this Section 20 thing. Oh, it's unnecessary, admin, just do it. No, you've, you've got to. You've got to consult. Um, sorry, soapbox. I get it. It puzzles me. Joe has at least, at least there is that provision within the BSA to appoint that building safety director for a building yes. safety purpose to help yeah. those um, lay directors. I, I absolutely support that. And kudos think... to Armour and TP, uh, IRPM as it was at the time for putting that forwards. Yeah, but then we'll, we started thinking about how much that's going to cost. But it it, it was a hail mary pass. Um, Mr. Goss, 
do either know if the L and FRA, I love the fact he's put the ampersand, ampersand in there, could mandate higher standards for information provision and instructions on completion. Uh, this is what I'm talking about, about the, what you get for the pack. A friend bought the flat recently, had no explanation, he was obliged to form an RMC, became a director and complete the lease. Yeah, I'm afraid part of that is, again, my soapbox, the government saying, um, or liberalising, if you like, uh, conveyancing, so everybody goes for the 250 quid online, never meet the person. Saying that, 20 years or 25 years ago, I, I had an expensive solicitor who just mailed me a lease, and my version was, well, I've, I've paid a solicitor a lot of money to look at this, I'm sure it's fine, put it in the drawer and never read it. So it's kind of leading a horse to water, isn't it? There's so much you can do for people. It just depends whether they want to take it in or not. But the old days of sitting down with the solicitor saying, right, let me take you through what you just bought or what you're proposing to buy seem to be long gone. I remember buying my first house, and that was exactly the same thing with the senior partner at the firm that I worked for at the time. Mm. This is what this search means. Yeah. So it could mandate it, Joe, but that's not a direction the government likes to go in either of the stripes um the downstream implications are indeed huge as as we said you find people don't know what they're signing up for what they're doing they i i, I had a dramatic number of walls taken down in my flat and it's only when i came to sell it it was uh, i realized what i'd done because uh it was my flat of course i can take a wall down right um oh, hasty license for alterations retrospective one i imagine yes, on that. it was it was it was my indignation did you ask your landlord's permission why the hell should I? It's my flat. And I'm a member of that landlord company. Mm. Yeah. And then the fire brigade came around and said, you've got to, you've got to put it back the way it was because you compromised the fire safety. I don't know. Look nice though. Um, leaseholder protections. So the Lena versus Land Street. You wanted to touch on, on that. Absolutely. Just before I do, Nigel, can I just flag one? Please do. There are four provisions of the leasehold and freehold format that are actually in force. We um, mentioned that at the beginning. We never actually did this. <laughs> we've got nine minutes, eight minutes. So we're through that, Cass. Yeah, one of them. There's one of them that I want to flag because I think it does make a difference, particularly for um, resident management companies. And it is paragraph nine to schedule eight to the Building Safety Act. The schedule eight is the statutory waterfall that um, sets out who pays mm -hmm. for um, remediating defects so those remedial measures paragraph nine to schedule eight prevents um so far as qualifying leaseholders are concerned the recovery of cost professional fees associated with liability or potential liability for those defects there is now a caveat for that and um, it's an interesting caveat interesting where government are coming from with the caveat but there's now a caveat to that so far as management companies are concerned and if management companies are incurring fees in connection with a remediation contribution order or a potential remediation contribution order then paragraph nine doesn't apply in those circumstances remediation contribution order by way of quick reminder that's um, a new power that the tribunal has to make an order requiring various specified people to um, pay for cost incurred or to be incurred in connection with remediating those defects in a relevant building. Hmm. Remediation order, do the work. Remediation contribution order, pay for it. Those are the two new orders. Okay. So Thank you. Encouraging, I think, um, management companies to bring those remediation contribution order applications. Perhaps they haven't had as many going through the tribunal as what they expected. Yeah. No, I think that's fair to say. So in the last seven minutes, yeah. Nigel. These sort of protections, we well, need one minute at the end to sign off. So you've got <laughs> five and a half. Excellent. Um, I get a lot of calls on lease holder protections, and those calls tend to start with you've got two minutes. Never two minutes, Nigel. Back to you your got five and a half. <laughs> your discussions with um with Justin. What we have, which I think will be really helpful to anybody that is wading their way through leaseholder protections at the moment. We have a suggested approach from the upper tribunal in the recent Land Street Management Company decision, and I'm sure that Fixflow will be able to circulate um, yeah. the link and details of that. Um, my Actually, on that, Jumpy, can you put the QR codes up so 
rather than this this slide. So we've got a few that one, and there's a fixed flow one as well. So leave those up for a couple of seconds so we can grab Cass and then move it on to the other one. Sorry, Cass, interrupted, but I thought might be. Absolutely. Um, my star sign is Virgo, and that's not my Tinder profile, but I, as a Virgo, I like things racked and stacked and organized. And what we, have, what we have in the upper tribunal decision, I'm not sure what's shocking you, Nigel, is um, we have that racked and stacked and organized approach to leaseholder protections. So we have a variety of questions. First one, is the building a relevant building? Really simple, straightforward. Do the leaseholder protections apply? Because they only apply if the building is a relevant building. If it's not a relevant building, because it's either too small or because it falls within the exclusions, I will see you down the pub. Mm. Whether the building is relevant building or not is so fundamental to all of this. Your next question on the assumption your building is a relevant building, does the disputed service charge, we're normally falling out about service charges, does that disputed service charge relate to a relevant defect? And by way of a reminder, a relevant defect is a defect that arises because of something done or not done or used or not used in connection with either the construction or conversion of the building or with works undertaken to that building in a 30-year window, 28th of June 92, 27th of June 2022. So casting your minds back to when erasure were number one in the charts. Information that you perhaps didn't need. Um, what you're then looking at, question three, is the disputed service charge a charge in respect of a relevant measure relating to a relevant defect. Is that service charge um, connected to costs that have been expended in remediating that defect or preventing a building safety risk arising because of that defect? Your next question, I told you that there were lots of questions mm -hmm. and racked and stacked and organized, but we'll get these circulated to you. Did that disputed service charge become payable after the 20th of June 2022? Watch out for this one because we have um, a case coming up on Hippersley Point in the Court of Appeal in perhaps not the too distant future that will look at the retrospective effect or otherwise. Is that the FTTP? Schedule 8. It's Court of Appeal. On the upper a Court of Appeal. So okay. it's gone FTT, right, upper tribunal. Yeah. We're now Court of Appeal may well go beyond that depending on the decision. Um, we're then looking at the leaseholder protections and whether any of these circumstances in Regulation 6.1 um, occurred. Regulation 6.1 is dealing with the triggers to provide the landlord certificate. If any of those triggers were engaged, has a certificate been provided? Because remember, if any of those now five triggers were engaged and no certificate was provided, then there are going to be cost consequences and an inability to recover those costs for remediation works. Then we're looking at whether we have a qualifying lease or not. So is the lease a qualifying lease? Have we obtained a leaseholder deed of certificate from that leaseholder? Is the leaseholder have they responded to that and completed that leaseholder deed of certificate? We're then looking at um, where the landlord sits on that statutory waterfall. I use the terminology ritual poor landlord. Schedule 8 mm. talks about whether a landlord meets the contribution condition or not. Then if they didn't meet the contribution condition, we're looking at the value of the flat. And then we're looking at whether we're dealing with cladding works or not. We're then looking at whether um, any of the disputed service charges relate to professional costs, et cetera, and onto yep. the permitted maximum. And Nigel, I'm conscious that there's probably about 40 seconds to go, but for those of you who are dealing with leaseholder protections, have a look at that upper tribunal decision. It will help you and give you that racked and stacked and organized guide to work your way through it. Yeah, I think it's good if Fixed Flow can send that out. And you've also got, is it a qualifying leasehold if they have less than 
well, is it their primary home and less than two others, et cetera, et cetera. Cass, as always, lovely to be with you. Um, you and thanks thanks for all of that lot. As loads of questions came through, which is always the case with the for freebie legal advice. He says being sarcastic about it. Um, I've got something quick to say. Thank you, for everybody, for joining the webinar. If there are topics you'd like us to discuss in future, please let us know because the whole point of this is it's hopefully a bit of a conversation and we want to know what you're up to and what, what's interesting you. So thanks again for coming. There will be a survey sent out shortly. Give us some feedback as well. Give Cast 10 out of 10 and me 2 out of 10. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. And it's 12 o'clock noon, the witching hour. Cast, thanks again. See you. Welcome. Thank you.